Today, we're going to be doing something different. I'm going to be talking about the best non-top five fighters in every single UFC division. If you're a champion or you have a one, a two, a three, or four, or a five next to your name, you're not a part of this discussion. And it's also important for me to mention that not every fighter that I'm going to discuss is even ranked. Some of them are going to be 6 through 15 in their division. Some of them have yet to get a ranking spot. All right? So without further ado, let's get into this conversation. So we're going to start off by discussing the best non-top five fighters in the lightweight division. Starting at number one, well, number five, I should say, the fifth best lightweight that's not ranked in the top five is Mateus Rebecki. And a lot of you guys don't even know who the heck that is. And that's because he doesn't have any notable wins, but I know Volkanovski 2.0 when I see him. All right, now this is the lightweight Volkanovski, bigger than Volk, hits harder than Volk, has a submission game, and I genuinely think that this guy will without a doubt be a top five fighter in the future. He is better than Gamrot. He's from Poland. He's the real Polish fighter in the lightweight division. Either way, the reason I say he's better than Gamrot is because, unlike Gamrot, he actually is a finisher. He can knock people out on the feet. Dude has vicious low kicks, wicked power in his hands, really good takedowns. He's like, again, the Volkanovski of the lightweight division where he's like short in stature. He's like 5'7", but he picks people up. He slams them on the ground. Powerful double leg takedowns. And as soon as the fights hit the mat, he runs through people with ease. He has a submission game. And I think that because this guy is so good at imposing his will, I can't unsee this guy, his style, and not think he's going to be really good in the lightweight division. Do me a favor. Make sure you watch his next fight. Whoever he fights next, he's running through them in the first two rounds. That's it. He's a monster. I think he beats most people outside of the top 10. Actually, no, everyone outside of the top 10, I think he beats. There's one guy that would give him a pretty tough fight, and that is Benoit St. Denis, who's going to be my number one best fighter outside of the top five. Benoit St. Denis, easy answer. This guy's the most well-rounded fighter outside of the top five. It ain't even close. He has finishing ability everywhere the fight goes, and that's very meaningful in the lightweight division. Dude, this guy's going to be a future champion, and I'm fucking sick and tired of people pumping the brakes on him. The only people that beat him right now are Makashev and Oliveira. I think he destroys Armand Tsaryukian. I do. Granite Chin, he's not slow man, old man, Benil Dari, you sitting there waiting to get KO'd. He's not. I know I picked Benil, but he proved that he was done. Benil Darius isn't even in this list. He's not in this list. Benoit St. Denis would run through Justin Gagey if he took him down. Now, I understand taking down Gagey isn't that easy, but Benoit St. Denis has the threat of the takedown mixed in with the nasty KO power threat on the feet. And you know who he has more power than? He's got more power than Rafael Fazeev, who I have at number four. I think Rafael Fazeev, although he had a really good fight with Justin Gagey, although he's still good... His kicks, which are his best weapons, may never be the same after that injury that he picked up against no other than Mateus Scamrot, okay? I understand that Gamrot has fluked his way through the division, but at the same time, it wasn't Fazeev that was tuning up Gamrot on the feet. It was close, but it was Gamrot that was actually swiveling Fazeev's head around like a stool, like an owl. He added Fazeev's head doing 360s with the right hand. Like, Mateus Gamrot was in there, and he was doing really well. That was a five-round fight. Fazeev's gas tank, questionable. Fazeev's power, kind of overrated. You know, these big body kicks can only take you so far. Like, I get it. The guy looks cool. He looks like a Viking, and he goes, <laughs> Doing that is only going to take you so far. But at the end of the day, I'm not going to get confused by that alone. I'm looking at, how does this guy stack up against the other fighters in the division? And I genuinely think that Benoit St. Denis would put a pace on Fazeev that would break him. So Rafael Fazeev, I don't think he is going to be a title contender. And I actually think he's a little bit small for the division too. All right. Mateus Rebecki may be in there with him. Rafael Fazeev is going to be a tough out no matter what. But I think that Gamrot may have actually done really well if that fight were to have continued. But let's get back to Benoit St. Denis, because a lot of people say that I glaze this guy. But in reality, I'm just looking at him and I'm saying, this guy's a complete fighter. He's a really smart fighter. He has an amazing gas tank. He has vicious power, 
great submissions. Like, how are you going to doubt this guy's ability to finish someone like Justin Gagey, who is a fish out of water on the ground? Like, Justin Gagey's ground game is horrific. Mateus Gamrot doesn't finish people, and if he were to get Justin Gagey down, he would probably finish him. If you don't agree with that, then you just don't know what you're talking about. Dustin Poirier, a bit of a tougher out on the ground. But everyone knows that if you grapple against Dustin, if you push a heavy pace on him, and you wrestle, he tires out very quickly, and he's got the hips of a 90-year-old woman. He's a little bit easy to take down. And I think that Benoit St. Denis could take him down. And remember, Benoit always has the threat of the takedown mixed in with the nasty KO power. That's just a nightmare to deal with. And because he's so complete, because he's such a finisher, he is, in my opinion, going to be a champion. The only two people that beat him right now are Oliveira and Makachev. But let's get on to the next one. You're probably not going to be surprised with this, but maybe you will. And that's Jalen Turner. Now, I understand that Jalen Turner got fraud checked. I understand that I'm one of the guys that hyped this guy up more than anyone else. But at the same time, I still believe in Jalen Turner. There aren't that many people that are this dangerous on the feet that have this kind of frame, that kind of reach with that kind of speed. Like this guy is a nightmare for anyone to deal with on the feet. The only thing that's not necessarily great is his gas tank, I guess, when he has a hard weight cut, and he will always have a hard weight cut. But man, look how easily he finished Bobby Green. And you could talk about Bobby Green as a guy that's gotten finished before, not necessarily the best fighter, but he's a really excellent striker, all right? He makes people miss all the time, and Jalen Turner smoked him, like, easily. And if they were to have a rematch, Dan Hooker probably loses that fight. I think that Jalen Turner probably underestimated him, chased after the finish a little bit too much. And even though I was the guy that was saying, Dan Hooker's been through too many wars, there's no way he's winning this, he's going to get finished, now, with an extra war against Jalen Turner, of course he's losing the rematch. Are you kidding me? None of these guys lose to Dan Hooker. But yeah, that's my list. Benoit St. Denis, best fighter outside of the top five by far. I think Benoit is probably the only guy on this list that would finish multiple top five guys. I think he finishes Benil Dariush. That's a top five guy. Easily finishes Benil Dariush. Not even a fucking question in my mind. I think he finishes Michael Chandler, who's a top five guy. I think he probably could beat Justin Gagey. If he takes Justin Gagey down, if Gagey doesn't knock this dude out, which he could, if Gagey doesn't chin this man soon, the pressure that Benoit St. Denis puts out, the threat of the takedown, the nasty KO power on the feet, Gagey's never dealt with anyone like that other than Charles, and look at what happened to him. As soon as that fight hit the mat, he was done. All right, so... Yep, this is my best fighters in the lightweight division outside of the top five. Let's get on to the next weight class. We're going to go ahead and do bantamweight. Now we're on to the bantamweight division. We're going to go with Saeed Magomedov as the fifth best fighter outside of the top five. This guy has the best ability in the UFC, in my opinion, to mix his striking with his jiu-jitsu on the feet. And I'm talking about going from striking with someone to latching up a submission all in the same exact combination. The shit that he can pull off is unbelievable. His submission against Muin Gufadov was insane on UFC 294. Hit him with a question mark kick, and then he just snatches him up in a guillotine choke. Amazing. That's like his best choke. Uh, beautiful kicking game. Amazing submission game. Good wrestling. This guy is excellent. And uh, it's crazy that this is the best, the fifth best fighter in the Bantamweight division because... The Bantamweight division is just so unbelievably stacked. Imagine this guy's skill set at middleweight, bro. Imagine this guy's skill set at welterweight. Like, that's probably a champion that we're talking about. Up next, and this is going to be a tough one, but I'm going to go ahead and say it is... I'm going to say it's Jonathan Martinez, and I'm going to put Jonathan Martinez in the two spot. Now, I understand he had a really close fight with Saeed Nurmagomedov. In fact, I thought that Saeed beat him. But if I'm looking at who has more winnable matchups in that division, now, to be honest, I still need to see a little bit more of Jonathan Martinez's ground game. But hey, he got past Saeed. He didn't get subbed. He didn't get wet blanketed. This dude did well in that fight. His leg kicks are just a nightmare for anyone that he fights. And I'm going to say this. The reason why I have Jonathan Martinez so high up, everyone knows this is the dark horse of that division. He's like the guy that... People still are sleeping on. He's not very popular. 
this dude has the best leg kicks in MMA, objectively. Like, he is tied for the record for the most leg kick TKO finishes in UFC history. The guy that he is tied with is the crafty vet himself, 37, 38-year-old. I forget how old he is. Edson Barboza. Jonathan Martinez is in his 20s. And he's tied with Edson Barboza for the most leg kick finishes in UFC history. This dude's shins are made out of something special. We think about Jan Blahovich. We think about Alex Pereira. Dude, none of these guys are finishing people with low kicks alone. I know everyone says that Alex Pereira has the best kicks. Arguably, it's up there. Nobody has better leg kicks. This guy is in the bantamweight division. This is not a massive human being chucking pillars at people. He's in the bantamweight division finishing people with low kicks. It's insane. It is ridiculous. He already has two low kick TKOs. But either way, man, this guy has an incredible resume so far. A win over Adrian Yanez. Finished him easily in the second round, dude. Adrian Yanez literally couldn't walk. Again, like not many people in the UFC land five leg kicks and are on the verge of winning the fight via TKO. That's how good this guy is. Like, you're going to have to check every single one of them. Otherwise, you're probably getting finished. It's a, dude, we're talking about low kicks here, man. Low kicks. Those are easier to land than jabs. This dude's an absolute nightmare. You're going to have to take this guy down or knock him the fuck out. And he has a good chin. So it's going to be easier said than done. Number one, I'm going to go with Song Yudong. I think that Song Yudong is capable of doing the impossible, which would be beating Marab Devalashvili. This is my nightmare matchup for Marab Devalashvili. Brick wall takedown defense. Dude, this guy has a granite chin. Never been hurt. I've never seen this guy get wobbled. He's taken head kicks flush to the dome, front kicks flush to the dome multiple times in his last fight alone, flying knees from Corey Sandhagen. I've never seen this guy rattled at all. He has ridiculous power. You know how people are picking Henry Cejudo to beat Marab because he has the wrestling accolades and he can stand with Marab and outstrike him? This is the guy that you're thinking of that could beat Marab. Like, this is the Henry Cejudo that Henry Cejudo fans think of on the feet. Guy that bites down on the mouthpiece, has wicked speed, gnarly power in the right hand, like devastating KO power. He drops everyone that he fights. He has a great ground game too. We've been seeing that a whole lot lately with this guy taking his opponents down, stuffing takedowns from guys like Ricky Simone, powerful wrestlers, finishing ability, amazing low kicks. Look at how good his kicks looked against a kicker like Gutierrez. Song Yudong, unbelievably complete unfinishable, good fight IQ, well-rounded. This is the guy that can get in Marab's face and put him away because he's a fast starter. So there's that. Maybe Jonathan Martinez too. Like these are some of the best finishers in the Bantamweight division. Song Yudong, I think this is like my highest hope for someone who can become a champion aside from Umar Nurmagomedov, who I'm putting at number four. I just think that Umar Nurmagomedov is going to be a little bit better than Saeed. Like Benoit St. Denis, he just has an aura that I can't look past. I know he hasn't really done a whole lot in this division, but on the feet, this guy, he has like some Yair Rodriguez type of kicking game in a way. Not as relentless as Yair, not as ferocious, not as many attacks, but his kicks are so incredibly dynamic. This guy's so flexible. I've never seen someone throw a lead front kick to the face as well as Umar Nurmagomedov, bro. So you have to worry about the kicks. You have to worry about the knees. You have to worry about the hooks after the knees. The exact way in which he knocked out Rowney Barcelos. The submission game. This guy's submitting people. He's finishing people. He's got knockout power. He's big for the weight class, as I said. He's got great wrestling. Abdul Manap in his corner early on in life. RIP Abdul Manap, but like, dude, this guy is probably going to be a champion. I have to have him on this list, even though he hasn't had great wins yet. He's undefeated, though. And number three, I'm going to go with no other than Figgy. We got Figgy on the list. Number three had an amazing performance against Rob Font. The only reason why I don't have the former flyweight champion higher is because I still believe that these guys ahead of him would beat him. You know what I mean? I do believe that even though Figueredo got past Font and he had an amazing performance, and I doubted the flyweight skill because he made Font look like a little bit of a plotty guy, which is crazy to think about because normally Figueredo 
is kind of the plotty guy that we see in the Moreno matchups, if anything. But he's a flyweight. He's got good fight IQ. His chin looked better than ever. I think that Song Yudong would probably finish him. Because let's be honest, figueredo has been through a lot of wars as well. And I don't see him taking down Song Yudong or knocking him out. And I think Song Yudong is a little bit more dynamic and powerful. He has a much better chin. And he's not getting rocked by Figueredo, I don't think. So the reason why I have Martinez ahead of him is because, listen, man, how the hell are you going to deal with those kicks? And I don't think Figueredo is taking anyone down and subbing them with ease. Like, he has a good submission game. He has decent grappling. But hey, we saw what Corey Sandhagen did to Rob Font. Figueredo wasn't able to do that despite taking him down. And I think that uh, Martinez might actually damage Figgy quite a bit with those low kicks. But anyway, let's get on to the next division. Let's go to middleweight. All right, who am I feeling at middleweight? Well, you know what? I am going to put Brendan Allen at number five. That's right, I'm putting Brendan Allen at the five spot, okay? I think that Brendan Allen is going to beat Marvin Vittori. If you guys don't know, that was a matchup that was booked today. A lot of people are making the classic mistake of Marvin beats him. He's not finishing Marvin. Yeah, no one finishes Marvin Vittori, yet everyone beats him, okay? Brendan Allen striking is improving quite a bit. He was rocking Paul Craig on the feet. He knocked out the man that stood and banged with Alex Pereira. And I'm talking about Bruno Silva. I almost forgot his name because it seems like this guy's career has fallen off. But my point is, Brendan Allen striking is looking pretty decent these days. He submitted Paul Craig, okay? He submitted Andre Muniz, which although Muniz was a little overrated and Paul Craig may have been a tiny bit overrated too, those guys still have a great ground game. This dude is, what, 27? He's got a bright future ahead of him. He is without a doubt on this list. The middleweight division, brother, is so stacked. Every single one of these guys is incredible. And I'm so happy to be making this list right now for the middleweight division because I remember just a couple of years ago, the division was so trash, man. You know what I mean? We had Marvin Vittori, Jack Hermanson. Those were like some of the best fighters. We were talking about Vittori as a future champion and Hermanson. We had people saying that he was going to give issues to Izzy and Muniz was snapping limbs like twigs and that was going to be a future champ. Dan Hardy was saying that Muniz was going to give Izzy a run for his money. That's the guy that would beat him. Thank God we're in a new place, all right? Because look how stacked this list is. Hamzat Chemaev is ranked number seven, I believe. I'm going to put Hamzat at my number one spot. Although Hamzat Chemaev has a horrible gas tank, he did go three rounds with Gilbert Burns and cut a lot of weight, okay? Now that he's at 185, I don't know why he gassed out so quickly against Usman. It is kind of crazy. I know he broke his hand in the fight. I get it, and... First of all, I don't want anyone in the comments telling me that he was sick. Uh, the sick news is post Kamar Usman fight. I don't don't even start with it. Hamzat get better soon. But my point is, um, Hamzat Jamayev still gassed out after five minutes, and having a broken hand is not a good excuse. But he's still one of the best first round fighters in the history of the sport. Usman is a former welterweight champion with welterweight skill. Even though the middleweight division is getting a lot better welterweights are always going to be better than middleweights. And I think that Hamzat may have an easier time with some other matchups that are more favorable. All right. And he still did good things like taking down a guy with brick wall takedown defense. And because he went three rounds with Gilbert Burns, I'd like to believe that even though his gas tank isn't good, maybe he can go a solid 10. Okay. Maybe he can go a solid 10 if he stops overtraining so much. But Hamzat Chemaev is in my number one spot. I think he's probably going to be a future champ, even though I don't think he'll be a dominant champion. Next up, I'm going to put Hamzat's boy, Ikram Aleskarov, at number two. I didn't think that this guy had wicked power in his hands, all right? He's just been knocking dudes out left and right. Now, I know the opponents that he's fighting aren't that great, but he's still knocking them the fuck out. Phil Haw's glass chin, but his last opponent, not really known for having a glass chin, Ikram Aleskarov finishes him with ease. We haven't even seen his grappling yet, and that's the best part of his game. He's also young. He's getting better. He probably can go a hard 15 minutes, unlike Hamzat Chemaev. He has a very high ceiling. I believe in this guy. But you know what? Actually, I'm going to put Ikram at number four. Actually, I'll put Ikram at number three. I'll put him at number three, all right? Because I'm going to go ahead and say that Imavov, I'm going to say Nasruddin Imavov, Fuck, dude, I actually have to rearrange this. I'm going to put a Mavov at number five. I'm going to put Brendan Allen a little bit higher than a Mavov. I'm, I'm going to put a Mavov at number five, and this is why, okay? 
I think that Brendan Allen might be able to beat Amavov if he takes him down. Amavov has been taken down before. He's been taken down by Strickland. He has a decent ground game, but it's not amazing. But either way, Amavov's still really good. Nobody had ever taken Chris Curtis down, let alone take his back multiple times. Chris Curtis is known for his takedown defense. Jack Hermanson couldn't do shit to him. Amavov takes his back multiple times. Beats the shit out of him. Unfortunately, that fight ended due to a no contest. But I like his improvements. Ever since he fought Strickland, he didn't look that bad in that fight, but he's improved a lot. Like the last time we saw this guy fight, he styled on Chris Curtis, who's not that great, but he's getting better. Okay, he's getting a lot better. I'm going to go with Roman Kopilov at number two. I think that Roman Kopilov is a fucking freak. All right, I think this guy is a monster. He's the Peter Yan at middleweight with a gnarly kicking game. And he's not got low output. He's finishing people with body shots. He's finishing people with head kicks. He's dynamic. He's powerful. I still have yet to see his takedown defense tested. But the reason I put him above a guy like Brandon Allen is because I just have a vibe. I just have a feeling that his takedown defense is going to be good. He's been training in Dagestan, okay, for like the past three or four years. That's the hole that he had in his game. His striking is ridiculous. Like, I do believe this guy outstrikes every single person you see on the screen right now. I think this guy would knock out some top five guys as well. Roman Kopilov, I'm going to put him at number two. I trust in him. I trust in Roman Kopilov. He's also 32 years old. So even though he's not in his late 20s and he's not going to be around for that long, he is literally peaking right now. And I think he's going to start running through people because he is at his peak. He's in his prime. Okay. So just be on the lookout for that. Anthony Hernandez. I'm going to put Anthony Hernandez right there with Ikram Aleskarov. Honorable mention. Probably the only honorable mention that I'll have on this list. That's the next fight. Don't think I'm forgetting about Fluffy. This guy's a monster. Like this dude is like a Colby Covington with a submission game and knockout power with his ground and pound. He breaks people. He takes people down. Despite him being kind of small for the middleweight division, he will literally ragdoll people, break them after five minutes with a ridiculous pace, and TKO them with ease or submit them with ease. Fighting this guy is terrifying. Like, he is the guy that weaponizes pace, cardio, better than anyone else in this division. But look at his wins. Like, this guy submitted Jung Young Park, who's a really good middleweight. The middleweight division is stacked. I wish he would have been on the list, but he just missed out. Really good middleweight. Submitted him. Mark andre Barriou ragdolled him, broke him, submitted him, okay? We're talking about Edmund Shabazi, and I know his gas tank's always been questionable, and Mavov finished him too, but he broke him so easily, you know what I mean? And of course, let's not forget about Rodolfo Vieira, the classic Rodolfo Vieira fight where he breaks and submits the high-level former ADCC competitor, okay? So Hernandez has ridiculously good wrestling. He's got an amazing pace. But I have a feeling Ikram could chin him because, again, Hernandez has been finished by a TKO before. So, yeah, that's my list for middleweight, man. I got Kopilov at number two. I just have a feeling that Kopilov has good takedown defense. And if he does, I think he runs through everyone. On to the welterweight division. I'm going to go with Vicente Luque at the five spot. This is just kind of the guy that I have to throw on the list. Now, I understand a lot of you were picking him to beat Ian Gary. I was picking Gary to beat him. He's still good. He got a win over RDA. But let's be honest, RDA was fighting the lowest IQ fight he ever fought in his life. All right. Spamming takedowns, getting them stuffed every single time. But Vicente, he can finish you on the ground. He has decent grappling. He has decent striking. So I'll put him at number five. I just think he's declining a little bit and he's not as special as he used to be. The guy that I'm going to put next is Sean Brady. I'm going to put Sean Brady at the number four spot, okay? A lot of people are hyping this guy up again and are forgetting that he's not that good just because he beat Tubby Kelvin Gastelum. Listen, Kelvin Gastelum, I picked him to beat him. I overestimated his wrestling. That's a big myth. Kelvin Gastelum is a wrestler. Fuck no, he ain't. And I'll never think of him as a guy that has wrestling ever again even though that was something in his back pocket when he was on the come up. He's still a fat, old school middleweight. Not old school, but like modern era, early modern era middleweight that's fat. Not that great. I was thinking, you know, Kelvin Gaslam cutting to 170. Finally, he's focused. But Sean Brady outgrapples him, takes KG down. 
exposes the lack of grappling in the middleweight division, and he's all right. But if you have good takedown defense and you're a welterweight with decent striking, all right, with welterweight skill, you should be able to beat him. And I think that Jeff Neal, for example, would destroy Sean Brady. I think that Jeff Neal and his great takedown defense, even though Sean Brady may shoot a ton of takedowns, he may get him down once. I don't think he's finishing him, okay? And I think he's getting knocked the fuck out. I think that that would be exactly what I expected to happen in the Kelvin Gastelum matchup, except I am knowing, I know that Jeff Neal knocks him out. So I don't want to hear people hyping up Sean Brady. Oh, now he's a future champ. He's back. No, he's not back. Bilal Muhammad knocked him out. Even though Bilal Muhammad was going to be a tough stylistic matchup because Bilal Muhammad's takedown offense is ridiculous. It's amazing. You can't be getting KO'd by Bilal. It's just unacceptable. So, yeah. No shit. I don't have fucking Sean Brady any higher than number four. But let's get on to the next one. I'm going to go with Orubai at number two. I think that Orubai is the real Renat Fakhradinov. Can the real Renat Fakhradinov please stand up? Can the real Shavkat Rachmanov please stand up? You guys think about Renat Fakhradinov and you call him a monster. You call this guy the best thing since sliced bread. Orubai is that guy. This guy destroyed Oros Medic on short notice. This guy has an aura. He has a country behind him. And obviously I'm joking. <laughs> All right, but I will put him at number five. I actually think that this guy is going to be really good, and I think his ceiling is higher than Renat Fakhradinov. I understand Renat would probably finish Udos Medic too, but I just have a feeling. I just have a vibe about Udobai, okay? Number two, I'm going to go with Jack Della Maddalena. I think that JDM beats every single guy on this list so far, including Udobai, all right? I think that JDM would outstrike Jeff Neal. I know that there are some people that want to pump the brakes so much on JDM, his boxing is ridiculous. He's one of the biggest welterweights on the roster. And despite the fact that he got taken down a couple of times and had a somewhat close fight with Basil Hoffis, he won that fight clearly. His takedown defense actually looked good. It was more the fact that he was pulling a guillotine every five seconds. And that was low fight IQ, but that's an easy adjustment to make. He's still young. Dude, I think the JDM's like 26 years old. Nasty power. Some of the best body shots in the game. Granite chin. I think that this guy might go out there and outbox Jeff Neal. Like, I like his hands a little bit more. And I think he's going to beat Gilbert Burns. All right? Jeff Neal's still really good. Jeff Neal's still kind of young. He's still getting better. But JDM's 26 years old. He's rapidly improving. And I think that he is the real deal. Will he be a champion? We'll see how long Shavkat Rachmanov sticks around. All right? We'll see how long Leon Edwards sticks around. I don't pick him to beat those guys. But I pick him to beat most people in that division. Outside of maybe like Bilal Muhammad and, you know, Kamar Usman maybe. But I do think that JDM would beat Colby Covington. Maybe. Maybe. You never know. But I still think he's really good. And I'm expecting him to hurt Gilbert Burns and potentially finish him. I don't think he's going to get submitted by Gilbert Burns. Who, let's be honest, man, can't really submit a fly. So let's get on to the next one. Ian Gary at number one. And I know that you guys are probably going to dislike this video right now. All right. Go ahead. I don't care. I think that Ian Gary is ridiculously good. The only flaw this man has, well, he has a lot of flaws, but the only flaw he has in his game is his pee head. It's the fact that his chin isn't that good. Like, I don't think this guy is built to take a lot of punishment. But ever since he got rocked last by Song Kanan, he's been perfect. This guy has literally fought perfectly. Not only that, we're not talking like Leon Edwards' perfect I know Leon fights at the higher level right now, but we're not talking Leon Edwards making it boring perfect. This guy has styled on people with high volume. He's been finishing guys, embarrassing them left and right, having no adversity whatsoever. I don't think anyone outstrikes this guy in that division right now. I think he's the best striker at welterweight, offensively at least. Offensively at least. I'm not saying he beats Leon Edwards. I'm not saying he beats Shavkat Rachmanov. But I think striking wise he's better than anyone else if you don't think so a no no listen you don't have to think he's the best striker but if you don't think that this guy is up there top three strikers in the welterweight division right now you're either biased and you're against this guy and you just hate this guy which is okay or you haven't re-watched his fights like you don't understand how good this guy has looked 
in his last three fights. I get it. He didn't finish Neil Magny. Who the fuck finishes Neil Magny on the feet? Who renders Neil Magny to someone that's absolutely helpless after a couple of minutes? Everyone can throw low kicks. I've been hearing people say things like, oh, all you have to do is low kick Magny and you win. Who is low kicked Magny and destroyed his leg like Ian Gary in the first couple of minutes to where he's hopping around on one leg? Neil Magny literally had to run away from this man. He was like fucking Jerry from Tom and Jerry. Or was it Tom? I don't remember who the fucking mouse is. Shit, dude. I think it's Jerry. Dude, Neil Magny was out there looking like Jerry. All right? When you're making someone look like Jerry, a guy that has more wins than GSP, you know you're good. All right? You know you're good. Not many guys are finishing D-Rod. This guy's only issue is his chin. He's legit. If this guy has a decent ground game, which is not proven yet, to be honest, but if his ground game and his takedown defense is decent, and I know he's got a high level in judo, and I've heard that he's got some decent ground game, he is the best fighter that you see on the screen right now. Will he beat Shavkat? I don't think so. I think that Shavkat's better than Ian Gary. Would he beat Leon right now? I don't think so. Would he beat Bilal? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about Bilal. Bilal's not very dangerous. I feel like you have to be dangerous, and you have to be able to mix it up. There's a guy like Jeff Neal that's dangerous. There's a guy like JDM that's dangerous. I think that Ian Gary just holds them off. High volume, long rangey attacks, too fast for them, too creative for them. One of the most impressive strikers that I've seen in a long time. Let's get on to the next. But anyway, let's get on to the heavyweight division. Change of scenery because I forgot to put the heavyweights on here. Okay, the reason being... Because I was thinking, oh, the heavyweight division top five is obvious. It's going to be Sergei Pavlovich, Tom Aspinall. But I forgot that we were doing the best five fighters not in the top five. So I just made a list. This is my list. Number one, Jilton Almeida, 100%. He's not top five. He's obviously the best non-top five fighter in the game, despite the fact that he's boring and you may not like him. He's better than all of these other fat heavyweights. You know the deal outside of the top five at heavyweight. There is not a lot of competition. Okay, Volkov is top five. He's not on this list. He may be better than Jilton Almeida, but he's top five. So there's no Volkov. Robelis to Spain. I think he knocks out Stipe Miocic because I have Stipe Miocic at number three. Okay, Stipe Miocic isn't even a top five heavyweight. Is he ranked? I don't even know, but I'm not counting him as a guy that's top five. Jones is up there. The usual suspects. Pavlovich, gone. You know the deal. I think that Robelis de Spain, the six foot seven Taekwondo Olympic silver medalist, knocks Stipe Miocic out in the first round. I'm just going to say it like that. Listen, you don't have to be a genius to know that this guy is going to get to the top of the division just based on how athletic he is. And this is not just, oh, he was like in the NFL. No, he was a Taekwondo Olympic champion. The guy's a fucking freak. All right. This dude has knocked people out. His last three opponents. He's finished every single one of them in under 10 seconds. It's insane. You think what? You think Muhammad Usman is stopping this guy? You, you think Parker Porter is stopping this guy? Oh, stop. He knocks old man Stipe out. Unless Stipe blasts double legs. But I doubt Stipe has been training blast double legs getting ready for John Jones. I still have Stipe in here, but let's be honest. By the time these guys would fight, Stipe is probably catching a kick to the chin. And he's probably going you know, 500 meters out of the octagon. Justin Taffa, I got him at number four, and I have Taitu Ivasa at number five. I think that Justin Taffa is Mark Hunt 2.0, and I I think he's a little bit better than Taitu Ivasa, okay? I think that Taitu Ivasa, he's taken a ton of damage. Yes, he's probably going to beat Marcin the Tubby Man Tabora, but still, I don't think that Taitu Ivasa is that great. So... Maybe you could put Stipe at number one, but I don't think he beats Jilton Almeida. You think that Stipe Miocic is stopping Jilton Almeida from laying on him these days? Stipe is good takedown defense. I don't know if he's stopping sauced up Almeida. So top five at heavyweight, actually a pretty good list. It's time to get into the light heavyweight picks, and I'm going to go with Johnny Walker at number three. Now you're probably wondering, what do you mean he's number three? He's going to beat Magomed and Goliath. Uh, I don't think he is. He got taken down by Magomed. He was getting outstruck by Magomed. He was looking too slow for Magomed. You guys are about to find out. Magomed Ankalaev is one of the most underrated fighters in the UFC. He's going to run through Johnny Walker as he was about to do last time before he landed that illegal knee, right? I don't care about Johnny Walker's flying knee that he posted that he never actually landed on Magomed. He's losing that fight. 
And I actually think that Khalil Roundtree beats him. I get it. Walker knocked out Khalil back in the day with a nasty KO, nasty elbow. How the tides have changed, man. I think that Khalil Roundtree is surging, and I think that Johnny Walker is being overrated. All right, I get it. He beat Anthony Smith, and he leg kicked him. Why hasn't anyone leg kicked Anthony Smith since? Walker actually fought a really smart game plan, but still, I think that people are overrating his performance against guys like Ion Kutalaba and Paul Craig. Let's not forget, he had been out grappled by Nikita Krylov. He got KO'd by Jamal. He got KO'd by Corey Anderson. Johnny Walker's been KO'd before the UFC. He has no chin. I think he beat Tiago Santos. I'm not 100% sure. I think he did. I kind of forgot the outcome of that fight just because it absolutely sucked. But my point is, Walker isn't this like gnarly KO artist anymore. He fights super safe and sound. And he's so careful to the point to where he's not actually able to like finish people these days. And I think that's an issue in front of someone like Khalil Roundtree, who will get in his face, who will force him to fight. Walker can finish anyone, but I believe that if you land first on this guy, Anthony Smith landed a good shot on him, I remember, but still, not Khalil Roundtree speed, not Khalil Roundtree power, I think that Khalil Roundtree beats him in a rematch, and I don't think that Johnny Walker's grappling is that great. Once again, got taken down by Nikita Krylov. Got taken down by Ion Kutalaba. I know he reversed the position and he submitted Ion, but Ion Kutalaba is one of the dumbest fighters on the roster. Okay? People act like Johnny Walker these days is some, like, ADCC-level submission god. No, he's not. Anyway, let's get on to the number two spot. I have Azamat Mirzakhanov at number two. I've never seen someone look this old but be that fast and also be young. Azamat Mirzakhanov, I think he's, like, 25. Look at this dude. I don't know if he's actually 25. He's probably like 31 or 32. Well, young for a light heavyweight, even if he's 34. But you get my point. Azamat Mirzakhanov doesn't make sense. This guy launches himself in the air. He has such quick and dynamic striking. He outstruck Dustin Jacoby and made it look pretty easy. And Dustin Jacoby is looked at as one of the best strikers in this division that's not in the top five. And he's even on my list. He's at the number four spot. I was about to put him number five, but I actually have the guy that just beat him at number five because I still think that Dustin Jacoby wins more fights in the top 10. Dustin Jacoby, great jab, excellent long rangey striking. He was beating Alonzo Menafield. He didn't win the fight. I'm not saying he won the fight, but I just cannot say that Alonzo is better than him after that. That's one of the rare instances where getting a couple of big knockdowns doesn't necessarily mean you're like the better fighter. I know that sounds like some horse shit, whatever's... The most efficient is the most efficient. You know, landing one big bomb may be a little bit more efficient than landing 10 jabs. But at the same time, Dustin Jacoby just, I can't say he's worse than Alonzo Menafield. But you know what? Alonzo Menafield is a ground game and Dustin Jacoby, even though he has decent takedown defense, hasn't really submitted guys. So there's that about Alonzo Menafield. He submitted Jimmy Crute. Literally sub Jimmy Crute, and that's a good grappler. Even though his striking is trash, good grappler. So yeah, this is my list for light heavyweight. Next up, we're going to do the featherweight division. Number one, I'm going to go with Mavzar Evluev. Number two, I'm going to go with Diego Lopez. I actually do believe that Diego Lopez is the second best non-top five fighter in this division, even though his wins aren't that great. They're not that amazing, right? Gavin Tucker... Pat Sabatini. Pat Sabatini's all right. He finishes these guys in the first round, though. And look at the fight that he gave Evluev. Now, Evluev's very underrated. I think Evluev's the dark horse of this division. Obviously, more proven than Diego Lopez right now. But I have high hopes for Diego Lopez. That's like the future Charles Oliveira reincarnated back at featherweight. But back to Evluev. An incredible gas tank. Great jiu-jitsu. Great wrestling. Pushes a pace. Great hands. Good kicking game. All right, and I think he's going to beat low-output Allen in their next fight because Arnold Allen, the guy throws like 10 punches around, and he doesn't have like gnarly finishing power either. And for the first time in forever, he's going to be fighting someone that's actually going to mix in takedowns that doesn't get tired. So Evloev's a monster. He's a problem. Even though he doesn't finish a lot of fights, he's still really good. I'll put Dan Ige. I'll put Ige at number four. Uh, Bryce Mitchell, I'll put him at number five. That KO that he received against Emmett 
that shit was so hard to watch. And I really do think that brutal type of KO could change his career for good. Like Bryce Mitchell on the feet isn't looking so great these days. I remember he knocked down Edson Barboza and I was saying to myself, man, he's got the threat of the takedown. His striking ain't so bad, but he's getting made to look like easy work against these elite guys in the featherweight division on the feet. Number three, I'm going to go ahead and say the crafty vet Edson Barboza. Now, I understand that he lost to Dan Ige, but a lot of people thought that he won that fight. And even though he's getting up there in age and he just went through a war, he's one of the craftiest veterans in the game. He displayed some of the best fight IQ and an ability to adjust in his last fight. There's no doubt in my mind that he could do the same thing against Dan Ige, right? I mean, Sadiq Yusuf could be on this list too. I could have Sadiq Yusuf right there at number five with Bryce Mitchell. It's so sad to see Bryce Mitchell number five, honestly, like barely even being on this list because I had high hopes for him. I didn't think he was going to be a champ, but I thought he was going to be like a top five guy in the future. I can't say the same anymore. Sad to see that, isn't it? Like, I think that, uh, I think Diego Lopez might knock him out because I know Bryce isn't really manhandling Diego on the ground, but yeah, Bryce Mitchell, I know he dominated Barboza, but I still think that Barboza wins more matchups. Sometimes the guy that beat the other guy is going to be lower on the list because they simply just don't win as many matchups in the top 10, for example. I mean, actually, if we're getting real with ourselves, I don't think either of these guys are winning a lot of top 10 matchups, but still, Edson, Mitchell, they're still really good fighters. Maybe Mitchell beats Edson in a rematch. I think he would, but I just have Edson ahead because I think Edson would beat Ige, and I think Ige would beat Mitchell. Well, guys, I'm going to go through this one pretty quickly just because it's flyweight, I know. But it is what it is, man. Uh, I have Tatsuda Taida in my number two spot. I have Muhammad Makayev in my number one spot. I'm going to go with Alex Perez, the pullout merchant himself, overrated Perez, in my four spot. I'll go with Tagir Ulambekov in my three spot. And... I'll go with the crafty vet himself, Tim Elliott, in my five spot. All right, these are the best non-top five flyweights on earth.